everybody here today. Uh, it is nice that it's a little cooler outside. Yeah, we'll be able to play outdoors this afternoon. That'll be good. Uh, so, last week we had uh, Father's Day. Um, and again, I want to thank all you fathers for being here today. It's not Father's Day, but uh, it's important that we as men to serve the Lord and be that example in our families. Some of us didn't start this until our, our children were adults themselves, but still we can be that example. Uh, it's amazing how many, how many people in our lives we touch, even though we don't know them. You know? Um, so it's important that we seek to follow the path that Jesus has called out for us. And that's kind of what we've been looking at here. Uh, Last week we had the, the gospel concert here uh, on Sunday. Uh, so the week before, we've been working in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We started out with the Beatitudes, and it just seemed as, as I was, my goal was to do uh, the Ten Commandments, and then we do the, the Beatitudes to see what God was telling us and how Jesus wanted us to apply that to our life. And what it seemed is, is that I kept, the Lord kept pushing me farther and farther. And there's a lot that Jesus wants us to know, you know. And uh, this whole section, uh, I have a red letter Bible, and you can see all the red words. Those are the words of Jesus. And those are the ones he wants us to live by as we walk through this world. And be that example, not only in our families, but in our communities and in the world at large. So, um, so I just felt pressed that we continue to, from the Beatitudes to the Sermon on the Mount, and we, we did that, and the week before last, uh, we were looking at, uh, uh, oh yeah, we looked at lust, adultery, divorce, and remarriage. That was a fun week, wasn't it? Huh? Yeah, and, yeah. I, somebody said, talked to me about it before the service today, and I said, sometimes when I read God's Word and I'm preparing to come up here, I think, oh Lord, not that, you know, yeah, so, so here we go. We do not, we do not apologize for God's word and we do not skip God's word. That's a pledge we made when we planted this ministry and we will stick to that as long as I'm here. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, as we went through the Beatitudes, Jesus was and is today through the written word teaching that as his followers we should live different than the world. We should live different that, and have a different attitude than the Pharisees had as they lived in their world at that time. The Pharisees, they sought to follow the law that was given by Moses. And they did. They were very good at following the law. They liked the law. In fact, they kept making up different laws. They liked it so well. Until it came to a point where it was impossible for anybody to live up to it. Right? But Jesus said... That it wasn't just about the specific actions, that it was about the heart of the people that were performing those actions. So it, it's not about the law, it's about the spirit we have as we go about doing that. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4 through 6, the word says this. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills. See, the letter, when it mentions letter here in the New Testament, it refers to the Old Testament scriptures, which are a summary of the law that Moses gave, right? The law makes people realize their sin, right? When we read the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. If we steal, and, or we take the Lord's name in vain, we recognize that as sin, right? But that law cannot do anything to alleviate the sin. That's where the Spirit comes in. The Spirit gives new life to all who believe in Jesus. The Holy Spirit guides us to a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. Remember, Jesus said, those who get into heaven will be those who have a righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees. And that's what he means. See? Theirs was shallow and external. 
Jesus wants our faith and our righteousness to be deep and internal. And out of that internal faith will become right living. And that's what we're seeking to learn today. So we're going to look at some more of that uh, in a moment here. But let's ask God to bless today, will we? Shall we? Father God, we come to you again as we go into your word. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will open our eyes, open our mind. And most of all, Father, I ask that it opens our hearts. Help us to recognize that you're speaking directly to us. Each one, you know how we need to hear this, and we pray that the Holy Spirit takes care of that. Father, I, I pray that as we go through this sermon today, the things that Jesus spoke back then, as we seek to apply it to our life today, will leave here in better spiritual condition than when we walked in. Father, we want you to know that we love studying your word. Father, we love being your children. And we pray that you'll prepare us to continue walking through a lost and dying world with, full of darkness and sin. Father, that we can remain clean and righteous and be the example to those on the outside. Once again, we give you praise and glory for all that you've done, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 42. Matthew 5, beginning at verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said that to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the allergy stuff is still going around. <laughs> Now hopefully that's done. Oaths and vows, which are basically promises, right? In Jesus' day, people commonly made oaths. They swore on everything. The only, the only thing we think about that mainly today is if you're in a court of law, right? You swear this is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, right? And, and it's okay to do that. That's part of that system. But what Jesus is talking about is that you and me are, are having a conversation, and, and you say, well, you know, I just, uh, I just walked 10 miles, and I did it in three minutes. Honest to God, I did that. See, that's what he's talking about. Frivolous use of, of oaths and promises and vows, okay? And so they made them, and people at that time were doing that for everything. And Jesus said, as he starts again, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, speaking of the Old Testament. And in Exodus 20 and 7 and Deuteronomy 5 and 11, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And that's what they're kind of getting busted for. And it's, if you look at Leviticus 19 and verse 12, Leviticus 19 and 12, from the law, it says, You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And then in Numbers 30, in verse 2, it says, If a man vows a vow to the Lord, or swears an oath to bind himself by a pledge, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds from his mouth. And in Deuteronomy 23, and, and verses 21, Deuteronomy 23, verses 1 through 23. If you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay fulfilling it. 
For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and you will be guilty of sin. But if you refrain from vowing, you will not be guilty of sin. You shall be careful to do what has passed your lips, for you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. So apparently the people at that time, the Jewish people that Jesus is speaking to and the ones that were gathered down the mount with him, he's letting them know that they had become untrustworthy in their speech because they were talking to other people. And not the, the Pharisees believed in this and, and the people. So they would just make an oath. Now, they had some, some ways they did that. To, to get, they needed people to take them seriously and, and to live by their promises. So, to do that, they wouldn't swear according to God's name. Remember, they were very proper about God and his, and his proper name. So they would swear by heaven or by earth or by Jerusalem or even their own lives. That's what the part about the color here is about. You know? uh, so that is, they're talking about the, the human life. See, and none of them would actually use the name of God. So that gave them some flexibility. Okay? And in the scripture, you know, it said that uh, if a man broke a vow or a promise sworn by Jerusalem, only Jerusalem would be offended, they thought. Or, you know, so they looked for a little wiggle room in their promises, right? And, and they didn't really have to keep it. So, they thought that the oath that didn't include the name of God wasn't binding or legal. Because if they swore in, in the scripture by heaven and, and by earth and by Jerusalem and by their own life. And each time, each time that they swore, they went to a lesser thing. You see that? So, because heaven, of course, is God's name, right? So that's that's very important. Well, the the earth, well, that's a big thing down here that we're on. So that's a little less important than heaven, but it's still important. Well, then Jerusalem, that's just a piece of earth, right? And then pretty soon it's just a person. And as they went down, they thought, well, if I make a vow and, and I vow it to this, then if I if I sin and I don't actually live up to that, well, it's less of a sin. See? And that was their game. And, and Jesus said, no, that's not how this works. It's not. Because, he says, in the scripture, heaven is the throne of God. The earth is his footstool. We're told that in other scripture. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Jesus Christ is his Savior. We don't take an oath by your head because none of us can control. Well, I know what is it, Lady Claire all can do something with the color of our hair from time to time. But, but naturally, we don't control that. We have the color we're born with, and then what it changes as we get mature in life. I keep telling people, Scripture says, all this blonde that I have now is wisdom. Right? And I'll just have you know, not everybody believes that either. So. <laughs> but see, you see what's, what they did? They took what was a right thing. When they made a vow to God, they were supposed to live what they said. And the scripture said, don't delay from doing that. Do it now. So they said, okay, well, I won't use God's name. I'll go to something else. But Jesus said, it's all a sin. If you don't hold up to your promises and do that, you need to be trustworthy. And these people had become untruths, trustworthy. The promise is binding before God, no matter what. If you make a promise, it's binding. No matter what words are used. But again, those examples, we can see what they were trying to do. But Jesus says this, again in the scripture he says, what well, I say to you, don't make oaths or vows at all. Simply tell the truth. When we say yes, it should mean yes. And when we say no, it means no. And people should, we should be people of integrity that when people know that. What we say we will do, we do it. And we do it in a timely fashion as much as possible. 
as believers in and disciples of Jesus Christ, we should be living lives of honesty and integrity. People should be able to trust and believe anything we say without an oath being sworn. We need to remember this truth from Scripture. We are accountable to God for every word we speak. So if we're, we're speaking and we're speaking untruthfully, now, I'm not talking about joking. I joke around a lot. You know, We go to the same restaurant most of the time. The people in there know us. We get to play it around and stuff. And, and I tell them. Then somebody said, you, you can't believe nothing this guy says. Joking around. He's like, put some pranks on him in there and stuff. And I said, I'll tell you what. If I'm holding my Bible in my hand, you can believe every word I said. But other than that, it's suspect. So, but that that's joking around. And I always clarify before I leave them. I just mess them. We're just playing around, right? But it's important. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes in his word that he agrees with this. He says in James chapter 5 and verse 12, Above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. We need to do that. It's throughout the scripture. We need to speak the right word. So, we know that. Just tell the truth. That's what Jesus, that's all Jesus asked of us. You know, it's pretty simple. Tell the truth and keep your promises. He also spoke in this section on retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Retaliation. Again, Jesus says, you have heard it said. And there's a uh, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. And there's examples of that. Again, in Exodus 21, in verse 24 through 25, the scripture says, actually, if you back up to 23, but if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, and strike for strike. And then Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, 17 through 21. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good. Life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. And then in Deuteronomy 19 and 21 it says, Your eye shall not pity, it, is, it shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. This is known as the Lex Talionis. Okay? Lex Talionis. It's the law of retaliation. And this law was not given if, if somebody injured you in some way for you to go immediately and injure them. It's what it was intended for when it went out was to protect the innocent and to make sure that the retaliation that did go on did not go beyond the offense. Is what it meant was if, if somebody accidentally cut off your finger, you didn't have the right to kill them. And all you could do was gain another take their finger. Okay? So, the, that law, as it's written there, sounds pretty severe to us, doesn't it? But in its time, it set guidelines against the escalating personal vendettas that people had against each other. They looked for reasons for somebody to, to say somebody injured them or harmed them or, or their animals or whatever. And then they would go beyond that in retaliation. It was a formula for making the punishment fit the crime. Making sure the punishment was not too strict, 
nor to leave. Jesus said in the scripture there, and at the time, he said, if someone slaps your right cheek, to give him the other cheek. Now, that was a hard one for me. I wasn't raised that way. I'm sorry. I just wasn't. I'm being honest with you. If somebody hits you in the right cheek, you got it as hard as you could get them, you know, before they had a chance to get you a gift, right? I mean, that's just the way it was in, in the world I grew up with. But Jesus said that's not right. That, that if someone slaps your cheek and says that in scripture, it would literally be a backhanded blow from somebody. They'd come up and like that. And, and, and it tasted a few of them in the day, but it was usually the back seat of the car. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I see I'm not the only one. So, yeah. so you know, it, it, at that point in time, back when Jesus taught, for the Jewish people, and still would be for today, it'd be a terrible insult. Somebody walk up and, and give you one of these across your cheeks. The immediate response would be to retaliate that in our humanness. But Jesus says, he said, but I say to you, give him the other cheek. Let him take a shot there. Jesus didn't ask his followers to do what he would never do. Do you ever notice that? As we follow Jesus' commands and his words through the scripture, whatever he asked us to do, he did. He received that kind of treatment and did as he commands us. And you can see that in, in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. This is prophesized what will happen. It says, speak, the Lord speaking through the prophet says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and sin. He did. We know that because in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 23, after it happened, Peter writes, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued and trusted himself to him who judges justly. You know who judges justly? God the Father does, right? And for us, he's given that authority to God the Son. So he did what he asked us to do. Now to many of the Jews of that time, and even to some of us today when we first seen that, that, was, was, that statement was very offensive. Why did you, why did you do that? You know, why did you say that? That we would take that kind of insult and not respond to it. Well, they had a special that they did that. See, the Messiah that they were looking for, they wanted a military Messiah. Someone to take care of the oppression that they were under and overthrow the Roman government and have them be gone so they'd be free of that. A, a Messiah that would accept that is not what they want. For us today, for someone to do that, that's just not right. I mean, it, most people wouldn't do that. Most people wouldn't accept that. But Jesus is telling us, as his followers, as his disciples, we need to be different than most people. We need to relearn them things that we learned. That they're like, when I was growing up, you know, a real man don't take that stuff. No. Jesus says a real man. Well, Jesus was a real man, right? 100% man, 100% God, but he took it. When he went to the cross. And he's asking us to do the same thing. Just imagine, at that time, Jesus lays out this new radical response to injustice. Instead of demanding rights, he gives them out freely. It seems in our world today that everything is about our rights and, and being treated justly, right? That's all we hear on the news. Somebody's rights have been violated, and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. And, and so, you know, Jesus said that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. According to Jesus, it's more important to give justice and mercy than to receive it. He did that. And that's what he asked us to do. 
he goes on to say that if anyone wants your, your tunic, give him your cloak as well. Under God's law, no one could take another person's cloak. From Exodus 22 and verse 26 and 27, the word says this, Exodus 22, verse 26 and 27. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. The cloak. The cloak was the most valuable possession, and it, it could be used as a blanket, a sack. They used to wrap stuff up and carry it in it. Uh, there was a pad to sit on. Uh, it was collateral for debt. It says in the scriptures a pledge. That's what it means. The cloak was, was collateral for a debt. Okay? Uh, and of course it was clothing. They were very expensive. And most people only had one. They didn't have a whole closet full of stuff. They had one cloak. Well, he says, uh, and the, the person was suing for the tunic. The tunic was the inner garment that was underneath the cloak. Okay? Uh, they were the cloak, uh, uh, the tunic was softer material, lighter in that. So, so it was worn next to the skin. So Jesus says, if he wants your cloak or your tunic, give him your cloak too. Let him have it all. Why would he say that? Well, the attitude Jesus wants us to have as his followers is we don't hold so tight to our possessions. We don't hang on to them. If we share, it's not important. Is it, is it more important to have the thing and be living worldly, or is it more important to let it go and be following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? He says, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two. This refers to forced labor that the Romans had in them at that time. They could demand ordinary citizens to carry the heavy loads for them. The soldiers could. And there was really no way under it. <clears throat> the Roman soldiers were armed with swords. And he could come up and say, you know, carry, take my backpack, all the stuff that military guys carry, and, and you take it a mile. The mile was a reference for a thousand paces, is what that meant. Okay? So a thousand paces was it. So he said, uh, Jesus says, if they want you to carry it for a mile, carry it two miles. Do it in a good spirit and a good thing. One of the commentators made this comment. If somebody comes up and asks you to walk with them a mile and carry their load, pick it up and say, let's just go two and you try to keep up. Yeah. See, that's kind of the attitude that Jesus would like us to have. Said, we'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll go beyond that if you need me. Then there's an example of that in Scripture. In Luke uh, 23 and verse 26. So at the crucifixion, Jesus has already been beaten. He's been, you know, he's shredded in that. He's carrying his cross up the Via Della Rosa to, to head to, to uh, the, the cross. He's carrying it with him. He can't carry it anymore. And they, as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who, who was coming in from the country and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. They just plucked the guy right out of the crowd and said, here you carry this. He had to do that. The Jews hated that. The reason? Because the law forced them to show that they were subject to Rome. was the reason they were so against it. But Jesus said, that's all right. Do, do it. Just pick it up and carry it. Jesus spoke many of these things. And that's how he was. He did those kinds of things. And he says in verse 42, Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Jesus' followers should have a generous spirit. A generous spirit. Because we as Jesus' disciples shouldn't hold too tightly to our personal rights and possessions. See, one thing we know and we have faith in and trust in God that if somebody 
is wrongfully treating us, instead of getting in a big war and a fight over it, that one day when the Lord comes back, he's going to right those wrongs. He's going to take care of that. Not one of the people who's ever went against God's people has, has prospered permanently from it. They may temporarily, but eventually there's judgment on what they do with that. So Jesus said, don't worry about that. God will take care of that. We shouldn't blindly or haphazardly just give away our possessions. One time, many years ago, um, and this is in the recovery program, um, we were helping a guy, and, and uh, he came to a few meetings and that, and he was really messed up. And, um, we talked about similar stuff, not this particular wording, but about this kind of stuff, service and helping others and that. He ended up at the mall, and he gave away his watch to somebody, and he gave away something else to somebody, and he was trying to give his car keys away to security when he got it. And they ended up, they hauled him up to the mortgage and put him in the special ward up there. And, uh, you know, that's not what Jesus meant. We're not to be foolish, you know, we're to still stand on, on his word. And he shows us the heart attitude he expects from his followers. But we're not to be foolish as we go through it. We're to talk to the Father, to ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us. Jesus says, this is how my followers, my disciples should be. They should be honest and truthful. They should be just and merciful. And they should be generous. That's how our Savior asks us to be. Just those three things. How much different is that than the vast majority of the world we live? We would stand out, wouldn't we? And that's what Jesus wants us to do. You know, when people say, you're different, you talk different about that. And I know when you say something, I can bank on that. I know when I need something, you'll help me. I know that you will show me mercy if I betray you or, or go against you somehow. Why do we do that? Because we want to be Christ-like. We want to be like our Lord and Savior. And this is a process that we, as broken human beings, walk through in order to do that. We aren't born to this. We're born to the world stuff, right? So we have to learn how to do this, how to be different. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us here in the Sermon on the Mount. He's got a lot more to say about a lot more uh, different issues and, and, and different uh, items. And we'll continue through that. But please, as you go through your life, think about that. When you go to say something, and I find this true of myself, I have to, I have to stop and think of that. Because what I say, instead of saying that is, is what I say, is it truthful? Is it necessary? Is it hurtful? If it's true, it's okay. If it's, if it's necessary, if I speak this truth, that's okay. Is it going to hurt somebody? Well, that's where the, the stickler is. We have to be careful. We have to remember, God's asking us to live by what comes out of our minds and out of our heart. Remember, he's told us in Scripture, what comes out of this mouth comes out of this heart. So he say to make this heart right, then the rest will fall in line. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come here again today. Lord, we thank you and praise you so greatly for the gift you've given us of our salvation. Father, the gift you've given us of your written word. The Holy Spirit who guides us through it and helps us to change. Father, we thank you for the gift of this community here at the Master's Day. Who gives us examples of right living. We do pray, Father, that you would find us to have a righteousness, a way of life that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Father, that we wouldn't just be about specific actions, but it would be about our lifestyle and how we respond to other people in this dark and fallen world. Father, we want you to know how much we love you. 
how much we adore you. And we do thank you and praise you for all you've done and all you continue to do for us. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.